welcome to the 71st episode of the Online Tennis Podcast. It's me, Jack, as always, and today I am very delighted to tell you I am joined by Mr. Gil Gross. How are you doing, Gil? I'm good, Jack. Great to be on with you. Thanks very much for coming on, Gil, of course. Uh, works in Tennis Channel, tennis analyst extraordinaire, paving the way for guys like me. Really a big fan. I'm sure you'll you'll love what he's got to say today. Of course, today's uh, show is, in fact, of, of course, there's been two tournaments on, but uh, Gil is here to talk exclusively about the Paris Masters. So we've got a whole bumper-sized episode on that one tournament. It doesn't happen often on online. As always, please like and subscribe if you're on YouTube, etc. All that jazz. Gil, I'm happy to dive right in. And the first place I want to start, big, big story this week. Kind of got lost among all the other stories that were going on by the end of the week. But right at the start of the week, we had uh, Gilles Simon retiring from the sport. Gilles Simon, of course, former world number six. One of the best French players, um, I would say, ever, in, in my opinion. And just, you know, such a likeable style as well as personality. A lot of people say he's such a, a likeable guy. Quick rundown of what happened before I ask for your thoughts as well, Gil. Managed to beat Andy Murray, who he had a 16 two losing record to of course at the start of the week Gil you don't know but I'm a massive Andy fan this was it wasn't it was very sweet because obviously I wanted it was lovely to see Simon's story keep going and the fact that it was against Andy of all people the guy he just always lost in the biggest matches fine I kind of forgot about the fact Andy had double faulted twice in the final game and forgot about the fact that Coltford had beaten him last year at the same tournament seven match points etc quite brutal Simon continues. That was that was all I was thinking about. Then against Fritz, of course, that was you know I, I love that. I like Fritz as well, but I didn't have any stakes in that. Simon talking about the fact he was willing to just die on court if he had to. Lost to Felix Auger Sim, as you would expect, one and three. He spoke about after the match the reason he was retiring. He said it would take him a couple of months to even recover from from playing those three matches, which is fair enough given his style. The fact that he's still going at this age, given how he plays is incredible, in my opinion, because there's very few players, maybe Andy Murray's the, the only other guy that they can sort of sport that style of play this late into his career, you know, this late into his 30s. He's incredibly inspiring. Your thoughts, Gil? What did you think? Yeah, I, he well, first to your last point, he does so much running, which is what you're alluding to, because he doesn't have weapons to finish points quickly. At the same time, he's... He reminds me just a little bit of Federer in the sense when you watch him move, it it looks almost easy on the joints. There's a fluidity to the movement that I, I think he has more so than than Andy Murray, where it, it doesn't look like anything is you know hard cuts and high impact. It's very you know great anticipation and light on his feet almost. So. Yeah, tons of running, but I also think he had a way of moving that kind of preserved his body. With Simone, though, and his play style, I mean, that's what's mostly going to stand out to me about about him and, and remembering him is because he's the kind of guy who, when I when I was first watching tennis, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, I'm, I'm on the younger side. So when I first started watching tennis, Simone was a top 10 player. And even to an untrained eye, to a newer person watching the sport, you can see, oh, there's different ways to win. There's different ways to play. The way this guy is going about trying to win looks totally different from how Joe Wilfred Sanga is trying to play. And <laughs> yeah. like there are certain subtleties. Simone was not subtle. Like this is the person who I would show someone who is unfamiliar with tennis. This is what a counter puncher looks like. This is how they play. Uh, in tennis, you don't always have to, you don't always have to be the first player to try to be aggressive. Uh, you can wait for your opportunity. And you can wait for your openings. You can be the last to miss. You can build a career around never giving anything easy, moving well, defending. So that's kind of how I'll think about Simone as one of the first guys who showed me that there are multiple ways to play this game. I love that. Uh, a lot of stuff you said there, Gil. One of the things that sticks out to me in particular is the comparisons to Federer, because you're quite right. Obviously, Andy, in terms of uh, counter punch ability and ability to track balls down, very similar, but it's so much more gritty, and Simone makes the game look really easy. You're, you're, you're quite right. And as a 
uh, from a coaching perspective, I have sometimes thought about using Simone as quite a good poster boy for technicality. Because you watch his strokes from the side, it doesn't look like he does anything with the ball. Like if you if you didn't see where the ball landed, and you see him from the side, it looks like he's just rallying. Basically, he's not trying to win the point. Zoom out from a bird's eye view and watch the point again. And a lot of the time, you know, he's hitting 75 mile an hour balls. He's, he doesn't put any effort into the, the stroke at all, yet so much of his body weight is transferred into the shot. It just makes it look so easy. I loved it. Go. Yeah, a pace absorber, like the ultimate pace absorber, where if you if you don't give him a lot of pace, he's probably not going to create all too much. He can on the forehand sometimes, but it's really about making super clean contact with him and uh, a way of, of redirecting the pace. And, and that's, you know, especially if you leave him open court, that is when he is going to try to do damage. It's not all defense. It's just a, a certain way that he produces his offense, which is uh, takes a longer time. And, you know, it, it's very much predicated around redirection instead of creation. Yeah. Super interesting stuff, Gil. Really, really, you know, thankful for the guy. I'll just pay my homage to him now. I can't talk about Simon all day, though. There are other matches that went on in Paris. Hmm. And one of the first ones I would like to talk about right at the start of the week kind of went under people's radars by the end of the week because we're talking about ATP finals and favourites and stuff for that tournament. But Danny Medvedev was defeated by Alex de Menor at the, the very start of the week. I'm going to ask for your thoughts on this, Gil, because super, super interested to hear what you think, because it's a very interesting matchup. But I'll let you know what I thought first. One of the main things for me as a, an observer of, an observer of Medvedev for the last three years, trying to sort of profile his game, I sometimes find it quite difficult to determine whether Daniel prefers a hard court that's a little slower or a little faster. And I think a lot of the time it depends on the matchup. So take RBA as an example. Um, in Astana a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago now, who he defeated 6-1, 6-1. That was a fairly slow court, I'm pretty sure. And Medvedev was able to lock RB into that backhand corner over and over again. RB struggling to get out of it with any sort of pace to find his forehand, because he does like that run around forehand, ordinarily is able to use a flatter backhand to turn around the point won't break down on that backhand ordinarily either if he's got a way through the Medvedev wall. In that those conditions, Medvedev was, you know, I mean, he was by far, I, there was a crazy stat I put out on Twitter for those who didn't hear it last time. I think he hit 300 makeable balls and he missed three of them. So you were talking a one in 100 unforced error rate. It was, it was ridiculous. So in slow conditions against players of that ilk, he can make himself a complete nuisance, right? Mm-hmm. against Demonor, whose movement is great, whose rally temperament is also great, he found himself sort of staring in the mirror, the sort of Spider-Man meme, right, where uh, the, the two Spider-Men are pointing at each other. I felt like uh, Demonor was very similar in some ways. I also feel like the fact that he is a very good mover forward made a b- big difference as well. RB didn't have another way of finishing the point. Demonor did, but the main thing for me was the fact that he was able to hang with Medvedev in the back of the court, where other players haven't been able to do that this season, and because it was a slower court, Medvedev looked weaker than he normally would, particularly given the serve wasn't winning him as many free points as it would in a fast court. So yeah, anyway, there's all my thoughts. Yeah, Demonor eventually squeaked him 7-5 in the third. I think after a couple of double, fa- double faults, maybe Medvedev was rattled. Either way, Demonor deserved to win the match in the end. What are your thoughts on Daniel's preferred conditions overall? And what did you think of the match? I think you're on to something because it depends on the opponent. I think when someone is really good at coming forward and finishing, you know, we've seen him struggle with Nick Kyrgios. Uh, he lost to Hercoc in Hala. He lost to Tim von Reichhoven in Hertogenbosch. He lost to Titi Pass in Cincinnati, who was coming forward. Um, he lost to Hugo Umber at the ATP Cup, right? These are all guys who, well, Umber more takes time away. He's not much of a net rusher, but uh, these are guys who have really high-powered offenses predicated around coming forward and and taking the ball early and creating angles. Um, and Medvedev's defense can be punctured 
when players are able to do that. In that sense, they need a quicker court, and and Medvedev actually is hurt by the speed of the conditions. But uh, I think the other kind of player who can bother Medvedev is a fast player on a slower court because Medvedev offensively, he's got one massive weapon. It's his serve. That's the big offensive weapon. After that, you're, it really dissipates. The ground stroke power, it's not awesome. The transition game, it's not very good. So sometimes Medvedev can play matches where he can't finish. He just can't finish. And it's against faster opponents in slower conditions. So I think, uh, interestingly enough, Demon Noor kind of checks both boxes against Medvedev. The speed is crazy. Medvedev, you know, I do think speed hurts Medvedev. Uh, speed hurts everyone, but I think that play style, it, it, it hurts him. And as you, as you said, Demon can finish at net um, to kind of expose Medvedev's defensive, uh, defensive, what am I looking for? His uh, tendency to kind of drop back in court position and kind of seed, yeah. um, seed that, that position and play very defensively. So that was kind of how I look at that, that head to head. And ultimately in the big picture, I'm very surprised Medvedev lost because I just, I thought he was going to get things going again after looking so good in Astana at the same time, it makes a little bit of sense to me that Demon Orr would give him trouble. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned head to head as well. Cause of course, Demon Orr was down love four, I believe um, he, he lost the last four meetings. There had been close matches. De Menor, just a good enough player to make the matches close. But yeah, I, I felt like a lot of advantages were in Medvedev's court. But I, yeah, I really do think it was conditions. And that was kind of the, the the only difference in the end. And the final question really is, does it hurt Medvedev's chances? Or was it more of a matchup issue on these courts that, that hurt Medvedev in the end? I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out what, Medvedev is going to do next in terms of results because as yeah. I said it's the second time this year I thought after he won uh, Acapulco it wasn't Cabos right it was Acapulco it might have been Cabos it was Los Cabos, Cabos. Yeah, okay. yeah. He, lo he lost to Nadal in Acapulco yeah, you're right you're right okay so it was Cabos uh, start of the North American hardcourt swing uh, and obviously Medvedev had not been having a good 2022 since that Australian Open final I thought it was like alright he's back here we go uh, Medvedev's these are events that he does so well at. He looked great in Cabos. He's he's about to go crazy uh, in this lead up to the U.S. Open, and it didn't happen. You know, bad. You know, tough matchups. They weren't bad losses, but he loses to Kyrgios in uh, in Canada, and then he loses to Tsitsipas in Cincinnati. Um, and then I and then Kyrgios yeah. in New York, of course. Right. So, you know, then Astana was kind of a similar thing. I thought he had that match against Djokovic if he didn't get injured. Or I shouldn't say I thought he had it. He was winning it, I should say, before he got injured. Uh, who knows what would have happened. But uh, he was, you know, really looking like the Medvedev of old. And now he comes in and, and loses to Dimonor. Yes, there are things that, that Dimonor can do to trouble him. At the same time, Dimonor had never... He's, he has a terrible record against top five players. He had never beaten a top five player. So... It's not the best loss in that respect. Going into the finals, he's one of the biggest wild cards in terms of I don't really know what we're going to get out of him. I yeah. tend to think he can have a very, a very good ATP finals. Who, who would underrate him after 2020, right? What? When he went in that crazy run of like 10 top 10 players in a row or something, right? You know, he hadn't done anything before Paris. Then he wins that. He goes into the ATP finals, sweeps it goes into Australia, continues this the streak up until Djokovic beats him in the final. Sometimes he just, exactly, I, I know what you mean, so it's really difficult to know where, where he stands. Conditions-wise, if it plays as fast as last year, again, this is this is what's quite interesting because in certain matchups, I think that would suit him. Uh, maybe, maybe Novak, actually, I think he would be better on a slow court with Novak for me. I agree. Um, because it's Novak that likes to play offense against him, so that might hurt him, actually. Yeah, I think um, in most matchups, though, it helps uh, the speed is a good thing for him. Most of them. Yeah. Um, because I, I do think it really requires some, um, a, a lot of excellent net rushing and transition play on a, on a quick surface to beat him. 
yeah. I'll leave Mev Dev in that note. Good thoughts there, Gil. This is one I, I know you've got plenty of thoughts on, so <laughs> I'll, I'll get you to chime in in a second. Raph has lost to Tommy Paul. I, I saw your, your video on it, Gil, so I will ask you to repeat a few things if that's sure. okay. Really, really interesting stuff, though. First, first thing I'll, I'll say on it, basically, Tommy's uh, win was, was, was exceptional first. You know, obviously he had that win against Alcaraz earlier in the year. This isn't so much a flash in the pan, even if uh, Rafa was a little injured. We all know Rafa can do crazy stuff even when he's when he's injured, right? So this is still, a, you know, he still had to go out and win the match, even if he got the breadstick in the final set. Tommy's ability to come forward. You were talking about this. You were talking about uh, Tommy's forehand inside out in particular and his ability to attack Rafa's forehand, I am, which a lot of players maybe miss tactically sometimes going into into a match with Rafa. They maybe don't know when to go into the forehand so much. I think he actually went into the forehand the majority of the ta- he time, did. right? But yeah, in, in general, you were talking about Stockholm last year, and I remember that amazing run. His a transition game and his ability to come forward, he's got such a polished net game. It's really, really, really good. Um, I was blown away again by how he, he, he pulled off some stuff against uh, Rafa in this match. I'll ask you about that in a second, but also Rafa's serving. You had a few thoughts on that, right? And how the injury might possibly be affecting that. You were talking about slice on mm-hmm. his serve, a little bit more slice and stuff like that. Is that right? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. In general, the serve looked pretty good, but there's also certain adjustments that Rafa made um, at Cincinnati when he came back after the ab injury in Wimbledon and the U.S. Open where uh, he he brought his toss down and he was putting it more out to his left. He was hitting more of a slice second serve. Uh, he feels he felt that it, it would put less strain on his abs by bringing the toss down and putting it out to his left. Uh, of course, you know you can't really hit that normal kick spin if you're tossing it out to your left as a lefty. Uh, you, you're really stuck with the slice. So uh, there are there were some positives for Rafa in terms of how well he served. I thought the average speeds were pretty good in general. Um, he was getting decent purchase off of his serve. And I did think the toss was maybe back to a more normal height uh, compared to what we saw at the U.S. Open. But the second serve still looked very slice, very slice um, as opposed to kick. Yeah, um, which isn't normally his game, right? I suppose he, he prefers a much heavier delivery to rather than going as aggressive. And you were talking about return position as well and how he was stepping into the court. Um, obviously wanted to try and finish points a lot quicker than usual. All kind of out of character. Maybe a few red flags going into the ATP finals, um, changing up his game to suit. At the same time, you know, it shows, it shows how good a player Rafa is, right? That he can completely rip up the, the playbook and come up with something completely different just to to um, work with this injury, I guess. So he's he's a little bit of a wild card for me as well. Obviously, he's never won. I mean, he's won what, like one indoor title in his career or something like that. Um, so not as much as Medvedev, but he's still a little bit of a wild card for me. I wouldn't put him right at the bottom for sure. I don't know if you agree with that. Maybe I'm being too kind. I just think on his day, he's always got a chance. Yeah, right? look, I mean, I didn't think he was going to have a good Australia, and then he won it. So uh, I, yeah, there's a certain gun shy approach where like you just don't want to say, uh, he's coming into this tournament, yeah. no form, you know, there, he doesn't have a chance. Yeah, I totally get that at the same time. Yeah, it just, I was gonna say he went to the French Open with a gammy foot as sure. well, of course, and he won that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He, 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 I didn't pick him to win. Um, after, after Rome, I didn't pick him to win the French either. So he's got me twice this year. I don't want him to get me a third time, but um, if if he <laughs> if he wins if he wins this ATP Finals, it'll be three. That'll be a third time that he got me. I'll be really really excited to analyze it if he does win it. But yeah, a lot of ifs, buts, and maybes. Obviously, Wimbledon as well. You know, he had to pull out, but he got Fritz in the, the quarters. I'm I'm not ruling him out for sure, unless it's Novak. That's about the only guy. I'm, I'm obviously you know with the seven odd eight odd match street match win streak on hard courts or something like that against him you gotta say Novak but anybody else the adaptability and the versatility that he showed in that match with Tommy Paul I can't count him out definitely moving on to the latter stages of the tournament 
the first thing I'd like to talk about is the first matchup we saw between Runa and Alcaraz in the quarterfinals. Few thoughts on this first, and again, Gil, I'll ask for your, your thoughts. I would say, I mean, I'll talk a bit about Holger's game first and we'll elaborate this on this when we get, get to the final. But I, I feel like Runa, if I was going to profile him, I want to say he is one of the best serve plus oneers we've seen in, in, in years, basically. I, I, for me, Felix maybe has the, the crown at the moment, but, but Runa has definitely got the potential to, to overtake that because the serve has just got so good recently. Obviously, that's four finals on the bounce indoors. Against Alcaraz, he showed what an advantage it is, able to just make his life so much easier on the plus one shot than Alcaraz. Alcaraz always struggling, having to come up with something a little bit more special to finish rallies in his own service games. He did it for quite a while. Obviously, the oblique injury, the oblique tear eventually got him. But you could see, generally, Ruina was making his life a little easier for himself. At the same time, as well, there were extended rallies that were outside of the serve that Ruina came out on top of because of his backhand. Now, I don't want to say it's as simple as Ruina's got a better backhand than Alcaraz. I think Alcaraz's backhand is world-class, obviously. It's really... it's it's, it's still, We're still to see, as Juan Carlos Ferrero said, he's tapped into 60% of his game. Who knows how good it could be eventually. You know, it does look really, really clean and, and great. But I feel like Ruina hits it aggressively maybe better than anybody else. I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but honestly, the way he strikes it is, is incredible. And he showed that in the final again, jumping ahead a little, but he showed that in the final too. What do you think? Do you think, I well, first, I think Runa should always have been winning this match on paper for me, given Alcaraz's current game, given his serve placement, you know, it goes into the body a lot more often. Indoors, you should be using your serve to your advantage Um and if you don't have that advantage, you're always going to be playing on the back foot against top 10 players, basically. What do you think in general about um, the match? I, I agree that Runa's serve plus one has been the main reason why he's just dominated the last four events he's played, uh, making the final in all four and uh, and winning here in Paris. Uh, but in this Alcaraz match, it was the extended rallies that on on paper, statistically, that was the difference in the match. Uh, where rallies five shots or more were were fifteen to three for for Runa, which is obviously it's it's not even close. And you know it wasn't until the second set where Alcaraz kind of settled in and started to match the consistency uh, of Runa, because you know I really do like Holger's decision making, his shot selection, the way he goes about it, because you know he, he is a short ball punisher. He does have really awesome. Uh, aggression off the ground, but he's also, when he needs to stay solid, he's totally able and willing to do that. Uh, he will, he will reel back the aggression. Uh, if, if there's no opening, if it's not there, he, he doesn't force things. He's not irresponsible in his decision-making. And, uh, I thought that was actually the biggest difference in this Alcaraz match where it was just one of those, you know, another one of those matches with Carlitos. And to be completely honest, this has not been all that rare, where Alcaraz, you know, doesn't have the timing, maybe lacking a little bit of confidence, and is still mm -hmm. just, still just trying to crush everything, and it just turns yeah. into error, error, uh -huh. error, error. So this is just the tendency he has. He's nineteen; he'll get rid of it. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it was one of those matches where Alcaraz was pretty generous with the mistakes, and Runa was not. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And uh, I mean, obviously we can't knock him too much. It worked for the first half of the year pretty much completely. Even at the US Open, there were, there were matches where he was patchy, but he found a way through all of them and obviously went on to win the title. So it's quite difficult to, to slay him for that. You're quite right. There was loads of extended rallies that he was losing. I do feel like, again, though, he should have, will eventually be able to finish those rallies earlier because of the serve. Obviously. We've heard so much about his serving and how bad it is. At the US Open, it was still great. You know, it was fast enough that he was giving himself a fairly easy serve plus one given the size of his ground strokes. It might just be his game, you know, in the same sort of vein as, as Rafa early, early days, basically. And that's not so bad. And he could still beat 
great players um, using the, using the weapons like that. But just because of how good Runa is at mopping up points so early, as you say, it was the extended rallies in this match in particular, but indoors in the future, I feel like we will see Runa, if Alcaraz doesn't change anything, dominate the, the rivalry. In these so it, it comes down to also physically what they are. Runa's taller. He's got about three inches, which, which really matters. Now on course, the other yeah. side, Alcaraz is quicker. So it's that classic, you're taller, you're slower, you serve better, you're smaller, you serve worse, you're quicker. Um, and that's going to be the, the dynamic between, between um, that rivalry, and it'll probably stay that way. What's your thoughts on the best serve plus winner in the men's game? Because uh, that's a big question, and it depends where you are, I guess. Probably, yeah. Indoors? Good question. Uh, pr- it's been a tough year. He hasn't stayed healthy, but I, I want to say Berrettini on this front. Ah, okay. I, I, but yeah, I think, yeah, Berrettini, Felix. Um, you know, you have... Uh, the th- Even Rublev as well. Rublev right? is up there. Djokovic is in the conversation at the moment. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fair, he, actually. He, and yeah, it's yeah. just, with him, it's more precision. You know, these other guys, a lot of, you know, a Berrettini yeah. certainly serves faster, forehands bigger. But uh, Djokovic is just, he's hitting spots and he's so deadly accurate uh, on the forehand. So, mm-hmm. yeah, um, we got to see it. Like, it is interesting though. Indoors, you kind of see who it is because you get those still conditions. And man, Felix is yeah. hard to argue with right now. I know, yeah, yeah. I, I'd probably say Felix as well. Going on to Novak though, because this is a good segue. I would like to talk about Novak's run. And perfect segue into the first bullet point I've got here. This was Novak's best tournament in terms of service points won since Shanghai in 2019. Now, Shanghai 2019, he did only play three matches. He did lose to Steph in the quarterfinals. Obviously, you've got a fairly small sample size there. and It was only 0.5% more. Also, another caveat is that the five players he played this week, bar Aruna, aren't the greatest returners in the game. Musetti, Cressy, Cacciano, Sitsipas. Nonetheless, the clinicalness with which he finished points this week was outstanding. And anybody who is... Is anybody on the bench when they, they watch Novak? I'm on the bench when I watch Novak. I'm just there to love it. You know, I, I think from a just pure tennis standpoint, it is so mesmerising how good he is sometimes. The first match I just wanted to talk about was Musetti uh, against Novak. And the way he he exploited and brought out weaknesses that we thought were kind of not there given the past few weeks in Musetti's career, you know, winning that title in, in Naples and and looking like he had improved his, his forehand on faster hard courts. Novak went into that forehand and showed that it wasn't, it, it still there was still work to do, basically. And you find out, you know, okay, I've still got this much more to do. It was like man versus boy for me, basically. It was just, it was so, so impressive. What did you think about that before I move on to his match with Steph? Yeah, that, that match I I was uh I was watching with split attention and you know the fact that it was six love, six three for Djokovic didn't exactly draw me in. Um yeah, so, yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't a match I covered really. Um but yeah. it, in terms of the serving, I mean I think we've seen it this entire indoor hardcourt season. Uh if you just look at I mean, first serve points one percentage. If, you know, I have tennis abstract up, I mean, it's over 80% in every single match, except randomly his, um, his match against Pospisil in Tel Aviv. That's the <laughs> only one. Bizarre. <laughs> it, that, that, so that's what I was going to say that the, the Paris, uh, service points, one percentage is 77%, which you'll be aware the, the, it's insanity of the height of that number, obviously, is mad. That's a good percentage for first serve points one over the course of a tournament, not total service points yeah. one. Just insanity. So, the only so thing good. is that that um, Cressy match really uh, can skew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I, I think Cressy won like six return points or something like that, right? Loads to say about Steph anyway. I'll, just, I'll dive straight into that. That match was great. Probably the match of the... Well, you know, Runa was great as well, actually. Second or first for, for me, for sure. If you've not seen it, go check out the highlights. In fact, Runa definitely, because the first set, Sitspass 
it ended up winning like four or one return point sorry for the first set and that went on till about two all it just looked like it was the same old same old the last two times Novak had played sets of pass on a hard court he hadn't sets of pass hadn't broken his serve generally Novak was starting to dominate this matchup with ease pretty much every time getting through service games so easily and you know just finding the odd service break six three six four was the uh, scoreline we predicted in the popcorn tennis community beforehand, a running joke for Novak, given it's like the scoreline he always goes for. I think he's had three finals against Sitsipas, by the way, that have ended 6 3 6 4. Wow. Anyway, after that, Steph comes out of nowhere, a couple of backhand returns, uh, completely out of character, of course, because the backhand return generally was the place Novak could go to for a little bit of safety when anything got a little squeaky against Sitsipas, maybe just getting unreturnable. But two backhand returns to get the first break of serve for Sitsipas, that kind of continued for the for the rest of the second set, also getting another one um, at the end of that. At the same time, the third set kind of went back to you know normal service resumed. Again, Steph only able to get the four return points throughout that set. However, you know, tapping into the sort of top 10 player that he is, the reason he's there, such a good sort of early point aggressor with this serve and particularly the forehand, which he's able to do anything with, able to come forward against Novak where he hadn't been so intent or purposeful in previous matches. So good at going down the line with the forehand and then coming forward, obviously one of the best transition games, net games in the top 10 probably. But the tie break. In fact, your thoughts first before we go into the tie break because the, the rest of the match is quite interesting. For me, those backhand returns, Gil, I don't know if you agree, but they felt more like a flash in the pan than a complete sort of rerouting of Sitsipas's matchup with Djokovic. Agree. I mean, you all you got to do is look at the first set return stats and the third set return stats. Uh, you know, it was one of those one of those third sets where it was close, but you know, easy hold Djokovic, difficult service game Tsitsipas and so on and so on and so on. Uh, Novak didn't, you know, I don't think, I think he got a little passive and to Tsitsipas's credit under pressure on his service games, you know, he was able to take advantage and, and win a lot of those baseline rallies where, where Novak wasn't really taking initiative and, and Tsitsipas was able to, you know, play some really good points in there to just, continue to hang on to his serve up until the tie break yeah and the tie break what were your thoughts on that out of interest well i thought as per usual uh the tt pass backhand let him down and then there was this you know really crucial djokovic scramble at at four or five that i talked about on twitter and led to a lot of discussion so we can get into that but uh tt pass had two two backhand trades where you know he wasn't under any pressure, it was a routine backhand, and he put it in the middle of the court and got attacked via Djokovic's forehand. So that happened twice, and then there was a third time where Tsitsipas had that same you know routine backhand trade and he missed it. So you're giving up three points on your backhand to me, and a lot of people who aren't watching maybe as carefully, they they see that as oh well he only missed one backhand. You got to look at the other two points where he got attacked and. You know, that's the backhand losing him a point. And when you watch Tsitsipas and that backhand, you got to watch out for how many balls is he leaving in the middle of the court? How many balls are attackable coming from that wing? Because that's why Djokovic goes there. He's not going there because he thinks he's going to get a million errors. He's going there because he thinks he's going to get something to attack. Um, so to me, you know, three points on that backhand, three bad backhands cost him. And then... He had actually a very good backhand. The score was 4-5 in the tie break. Mm -hmm. And Djokovic was in his forehand corner defending. Instead of going cross-court to the forehand, he goes down the line to the backhand. And Tsitsipas actually hits a really good one. Cross-court into the open court, gets the short ball. And uh, Djokovic is recovering out of his backhand corner. But instead of actually recovering, he looks like he's going to recover. Instead, he stays in the corner. Tsitsipas goes behind him, but Djokovic is right there and uh, makes, you know, hits a passing shot. Tsitsipas misses a, a somewhat easy volley. And then it's 6 4 Djokovic and he closes out the tie break. There's a lot of debate about, like, 
did Tsitsipas make some sort of terrible error by going by trying to go back behind Djokovic? I don't think he did. I thought Novak mm-hmm. did a really good job selling like he was going to run into the open court. The orientation of his hips were completely to the forehand corner, and then he just stopped on a dime. To me, it's just great anticipation, great off-ball movement by Djokovic, and he got him. That's a very good point. I saw your freeze frame, actually. I didn't notice that Novak had already... He he looked like he was going to set off in that direction, so he gave him the old sort of fake and bake and uh, left Tsitsipas scratching his head, basically. A lot of people saw it, and and I didn't explain it on Twitter. I just posted the screen grabs, and a lot of people... It looks like, if you're not looking at Djokovic's hips, it looks like, obviously, he should take the forehand inside in to the open court. But if you just look at Novak's hips, you you see that it, it looks like he's not going to actually cover the backhand side at all. It looks like he's completely sprinting to the open court into his forehand yeah. wing. And that's what Tsitsipas saw. That's what he saw. That's why he tried to go back behind Djokovic. So sneaky. I love that. I love that sort of stuff, honestly. And it's the reason Novak is like 15-4 in tie breaks this year. You know, he's, he, well, not actually. I, for me, it's lockdown modes. Is Novak's like signature tie break mode, right? Just refuses Definitely. to mess. We saw 2019 Wimbledon final, right? Is the, the signature one for that. But yeah, stuff like that. Little pieces of micro analysis, Gil. I love that. Really, really good spot. Really interesting. Sets the pass, obviously. I think on a lot of people's lists now as a maybe for the ATP finals, having won it in the past. For me, you've still got three favourites above him and they're a fair gap ahead of him for me. You know, Felix Medvedev, who's still a bit of a wild card, and Novak. I don't know if you agree. Am I harsh? I don't know. Um, I, I saw some really good signs there uh, in that match just in terms of how Tsitsipas was competing. That's been one of the main concerns, I think, this year is uh, Stefanos, who I generally regarded as like a very hardened competitor who who always, you know, gave a, gave a lot of effort at all times. There have been moments this year where I just haven't felt that's the case, and that's been that's been eyebrow raising. Uh, but this was kind of back to the the Titi Pass, you know, who expects to beat a top player, and you know, I I just love the way he competed there. Yeah, I, I feel you on on some of the weaknesses that have been un, unaddressed. You know, the backhand still being a little bit rough. So ultimately, I agree with you. At the same time, indoor hard courts, that's where that's where because of his serve plus one, um, he can he can make some serious noise more so than when you go outdoors at you know an Australian Open or a U.S. Open. All his titles on hard courts are indoors. Yeah. Very good point, Gil. Very good point. So, okay, I'll revise that a little bit, maybe. I, closer to Medvedev, but still fourth favourite for me. Uh, in the top tier, though, at least, you know, top half of the, the favourites for me. Moving on, I'm going to, unless you've got any thoughts about it, I was going to move past Holger and Felix, because for me it was more a matter of fatigue. Obviously, Holger still had to play a great match, still had to maintain his level to, to, to make it as easy as it was. But did, did you see anything apart from Felix maybe waning a bit? No, I mean, that's fair. It was it was the kind of thing, whoever lost the match, you know, Holger or Felix, it was going to be that, you know, a result that you just kind of chalk up to, look, it's been a lot of tennis, and at, at some point it was going to end here. Uh, but mm-hmm. I, I'll just say statistically, the the amount of success that Runa was able to have against Felix's first serve, nobody's done that to Felix since Rude in Montreal before the U.S. Open uh, when Casper just yeah. crushed him. Um, so it was by far the best anyone has played against Felix's first serve. That's interesting. Okay, that's interesting to take into the final then, which I am just about to move on to. Before we do, though, do you remember at the start of the week, before Runa went on his streak of five top ten wins, he uh, defeated Stan Wawrinka and saved three match points. And at the end of the match, Stan said, stop being such a baby in the court, basically, or words to that effect. The dra- a tiny bit on the drama, Gil. Do you believe there's there's it's fair enough that Runa gets the stick he does? Do you think the comments from Stan were fair? Yeah, for sure. Um, but 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think Stan I don't think Stan wanted anybody to hear that. So I I, uh. I think the way he said it, you know, kind of quiet, close to Runa's ears. I mean, geez, these modern microphones are good uh, that they put on the court. Yeah. They are really, really good yeah. because, you know, if Stan had said that in a manner where it, he wanted it to be public, I would have kind of said, all right, that wasn't really cool. But I think Stan was legitimately just trying to say that to Holger. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he wanted You're anyone to right. hear. So in that yeah. in that respect, you know, I give Stan a pass. I also kind of give Holger. I, I don't look. Holger's not hurting anyone uh, with with what he's, he's right. doing. Well, yeah. You know. Um, yeah. So I get why players are are annoyed by him um, with with how he carries himself on the court. I I think I get it. Um. I got to, you know, but again, I, I don't think that's really a bad thing. I think there's a room, there's, there's space for that in, in our sport. Yeah, no, you, you, you're right. I mean, it's a different personality, right? Gil, it's uh, something else to tap into. It certainly translates to fireiness on the court as well. Mm -hmm. And he seems likable. So uh, yeah, back to the tennis skill. I would love for you to take the reins on the final first and then I can give you my thoughts just to, uh, do a trade basically i've went first on all the other ones what were your thoughts in the final um well i thought first of all runa's weapons you know you, you talked about his serve plus one earlier djokovic and medvedev you know these guys are the ultimate test for players who want to finish points quickly with serve plus one with their return and defense so i was very intrigued to see was runa going to be able to do it against novak and the answer was pretty much yes. You know, he won a lot of he won a lot of easy points um, behind his first serve, which was huge. And it wasn't really unreturned serves because you know Novak's going to get it back. I, it was really the plus one that stood out to me that stood up to Djokovic's defense. So that was the first thing. And then I'd say the the second thing that stood out was was how many mistakes Novak made when he had opportunities. The love forty yeah. in the second set. He, yeah, forgot about that moment. Yeah, yeah. where it, it looked like it was going to be a set and a break lead. It wasn't that Novak lost the break points; it was how he lost them. You know, he had an overhead yeah. at thirty forty. He had a pretty easy passing shot at love forty. Um, he missed a return. That was the other one at fifteen forty. Like he's actually not asking Runa to do anything yeah. spectacular there. That was his second missed return of the match, I believe, to put it into context. Mm -hmm. So he put every other return into the court bar one, yep. and then all of a sudden that one missed return. So you're, you're quite right. Yeah. Um, luck? I don't know. Whatever you want to call it. You have to have a slice of something bizarre to, to beat Novak in these conditions, right? I, it was just one of those days. Like It's going to happen, I think, a couple times a year to a guy like Novak where it's just nothing could go right in these big moments. And um, yeah, I, I it yeah. wasn't one of his better matches in, in terms of being clutch. Um, like th there were yeah. a lot of head scratchers. Like, I don't know. Remember the volley uh, when, when he was up three, one in, he was up three, one in the third set. So up a break in the third set and the game, he got broken. Oh my the, God. The 30, yeah. 15, the 30, 15 point, he had one of the easiest volleys you can get. And I, I still don't understand what happened there. He hit it right back to Runa, who is way off the court. Um, so there's a lot of moments like that. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. It was. Yeah, I know the point. I know the point. You mean now he puts it straight back yeah. to him, right? And you're Correct. you're left scratching your head like, what the? I think that was the same game actually as the drop shot lob combo that should have been an easier lob. And um, so it was a, it was a bizarre game from thirty love up three one in the third yeah. set. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen against Novak. So I was I was left because I, I tuned in uh, for the first time near the end of the third set at about 3-1, knowing who won the match. And I, I was like, I must have got that wrong. I, I must have seen Novak won the match then and, and just completely missed seeing it. It was bizarre. It doesn't happen. So you're, you're right. On the bigger points, even though Novak was able to play really well in other points, those sort of slip-ups just aren't him at all. One of, the, one of the most interesting stats I was able to unearth. In third sets, on hard courts, rarely does Djokovic get broken twice. There are only two players, in fact, 
who have taken Djokovic to a deciding set on a hard court and been able to break him on multiple occasions in that set more than once. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Federer was able to do it in three different matches and RBA was able to do it twice. Nobody else has been able to do it twice. That's it's a, quite an interesting one. Yeah, that's a great one. And of course, Djokovic had never uh, lost a he had never lost a Masters final after winning the first set. Yeah, the expansion to that is he had only lost one match previously on a hard court final in a hard court final uh, from a setup, and that was to Stan Wawrinka at the U.S. Open in 2016. So he's now 54 and two in hardcourt finals after winning the first set. Comparatively, Novak is 10-18 after losing the first set in hardcourt finals. Mind-boggling stats. Insanity at that 3-1 game to not come through there. At the same time, the other side of the coin and what you're talking about, on the break points in the final game, serve plus one from uh, Holger on one of them, serve plus one on another, with an overhead smash to finish, unreturnable serve on another. Yep. On break points at 6 5, all the credit's got to go to him, right? Even though there were a few unforced errors from Novak and other break points, you don't see other players doing that as easily. Yeah, as well. absolutely. Um, I, I looked at all three of those on, on my Monday match analysis, and the breakdown was three and three. Now, there were three mistakes by Novak, there were three examples of Runa with early rally um violence on on his serve so yeah it's a, it's a good way of putting it so in the future this one went to holger is this a fair reflection on how the matchup could play or do you think this is maybe a little bit of a flash in the pan and novak will probably be able to give a, a higher level in the future because obviously if somebody pulls out of the atp finals we could see Holger and Novak play again. Well, I think, I think Holger, I think Novak will play a better match um, almost always. You know, I, again, I don't think that was a good night for him. Um, Holger will also get better. He's nineteen, so yeah, I think that's the best answer I I have for that. But the, what's I think what's interesting is both of them are pretty difficult players to game plan for um, in terms of. Oh, like this, this is their weakness. This is their strength. Like this is how you attack. These are the opponents that do well against them. Runa has a similar thing to Djokovic where, uh, there's not, there's nothing obvious in terms of shortcomings with him. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, he's, he's only, he's got a very clean game and I, I, I see in the future and, and again, it will depend on the conditions. I, I, I don't know how much you agree with this because I've not heard you talk about it too much. Obviously, you've heard me talk about it a little. I think the backhand is massive. I really think it's massive, and I think it's a game changer. I think it's a game changer against other players. And we saw it a few times, bail them out of really tricky positions in this match. Serve plus one backhand winners. Yeah. Occasionally, like 30 all halfway through the, the third set. I believe Juice as well at 3-4. Mm-hmm. To, to do that, obviously, is, is huge. And that was another moment where Novak... Could have ran away with it, but Holger comes up that with was a good one. We saw it in, um, yeah, it was, it was massive, exactly. And we saw it in Stockholm as well against Sitsipas. The backhand cross court rallies weren't just like locked down and waiting for a short ball. He was so aggressive with the backhand. You know, he made uh, Sitsipas look like he was struggling for time constantly. I, I feel it's, it's one of the biggest potential weapons we could see in the game. Is, is that fair, or do you think on a different day, Medvedev, Djokovic's of the world would be able to find errors there on the backhand. Um, yes. No, I, I think it's a huge strength for for Runa. Um, it's it's a really really awesome shot. There's there's no doubt. Um, I, I but I do think his peers also have it. Like Sinner and Alcaraz, if you want to look at those guys as yeah. his peers, that's the commonality between all three of them. Is you go to that two hander. And you're not safe. You're not safe at all. Um, they can really hurt you on it. Uh, and I also really liked in this match, and I think it definitely deserves a shout out in this conversation, is how good his backhand drop shot and his backhand slice was in this third set. Yes. So mm-hmm. that to me is why he out backhanded Djokovic 
in this match is not because, you know, his drive was so overwhelming, but because he was mixing in those drop shots in the slice really, really well. Yeah, like Alcaraz. And it's a shame Sinner doesn't uh, have this in his arsenal yet. Those two players, Alcaraz and Ruina, have such big backhands. That's the reason they're able to play the drop shot so handily. You know, allows him to play it with players on the back foot where other players might not have that that privilege mm-hmm. as easily, I guess. Um, so it, it's huge for Alcaraz and Ruina. And uh, it wasn't quite a game changer, the drop shot for me. There was a few points he used it really well in this match. The slice definitely was, I would say. He, he defended himself really well. And that could be a big factor in the future. Um yeah, in general, I, I I'm just I'm I'm blown away by it. You're quite right. I suppose there are other players that have it as well, but it, it could be a a game changer if uh, Runa meets Djokovic in the future again. For me, I don't know. We'll see though, Gala. It really is early days. It was a really exciting week for for fans of the sport in general to see Holger Runa and merge like this. Extremely exciting for next year. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, uh, agreed on that last point. There's two teenagers in the top ten. Strangely, I haven't seen a stat that says when that last happened. So I might actually look into that. Uh, I just thought I just thought about it uh, just now. Um, <laughs> but but it's it's a very exciting storyline for next year. The emergence of Runa. Uh, we've seen it before. Like when you go on a run on the indoor hard court in the fall, you do have to prove it that you are going to continue it into next year because we have seen sometimes that it doesn't. Quite right, Gil. Thank you very much for joining me. Anybody who would like to see any of Gil's work, catch him on Twitter. Is it at Gil Gross? Yeah, with an underscore. Gil with two L's, underscore Gross. Cool, Gil. Please go give him a follow, of course. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe. Myself, you can catch me at on the line underscore Jack on Twitter. Gil, once again, thank you very much. Had, had a lot of fun. Appreciate you having me on. No worries, Gil. Thanks very much, guys. Catch you next time on the On the Line Tennis Podcast. Cheers.